Good afternoon people. It's Saturday afternoon and uh, I was going to go to the workshop yesterday and shoot a video uh, but we had a bit of a panic on and it just didn't come off and I was going to go again today but it's now four o'clock and uh, time's rushing on so what I've decided to do is further to the problem with the TIG welder uh, I've got a wiring diagram for it which is stuck to the inside of the metal case. Uh, it's not actually a wiring diagram, it's what's known as a schematic and it's not the same thing. And, and what I want to do today is just show you the, the difficulty caused by the use of schematics instead of the use of proper wiring diagrams using standard international symbols. When I was trained, we had a, a system of SI symbols which were used throughout the electrical industry. Uh, we assumed throughout the world. However, uh, those standards have been changed and now when you pick up a wiring diagram you can see all sorts of conflicting things on it. If it's got a bit grubby in use, it's very difficult to read because you can't tell whether a wire crosses or joins because the symbol for crossing without joining has been dropped. Uh, they seem to have adopted a standard rectangle for resistors, capacitors, uh, inductors uh, instead of the standard international symbols which again makes the wiring diagram harder to read. Uh, but what I'm going to do, try and do now is just set up in the manner of uh, bigclivelive.com so that you can see down onto the table and see the wiring diagram. Uh, I'm one of Big Clive's great admirers, I, I must admit, I really enjoy his channel. It's a lot of fun and it's a lot of good technical information as well. Uh, so I'm going to try and set that up and I might uh, swap from the GoPro to the, uh, to the phone camera and see how it works. Uh, I've got a bit of a cough. You might notice me coughing. Don't worry. I haven't got coronavirus, but I have got chronic hay fever and also sinusitis. So if you hear me going, <coughs> <coughs> don't worry. Okay, catch you later. If I can turn it off, that is. Go. Well, here it is, people. It's a rig involving two wine bottle pourers, a stick, a GoPro clamp and a used and battered iPhone. <laughs> but I think it'll work. So I'm going to try it out and see. Let's see what happens. Okay. Right people, the diagram you see here is a diagram I've drawn which is of uh, the starting circuit for a Colchester student, Mark One. Uh, this is uh, one I drew for Richard Kirkman on the Model Engineer Forum. Uh, we were trying to sort out how to get his, uh, his student functioning again. Uh, this is the contactor and this is the remote stop start switch. Now as you can see the contactor is all in one place and the remote stop start switch is all in one place with the contacts shown as they actually work and the dot at the top indicates that you press down there and this shows the switch positions that's in the off position that's the intermediate position and that's the on position so you can see clearly with this type of diagram exactly how uh, the thing works and you can think your way through the circuit. You see we've got the coil here, that's the coil in the uh, contactor. This dotted line indicates that all these three sets of contacts, four sets of contacts sorry, are linked together mechanically. This dotted line signifies that these sets of contacts are uh, linked together mechanically. This off position shows the resting position of the contacts when it's off. 
right? And these show the positions in the intermediate position and when it's on, right? So you can think your way through the circuit by starting at A1, which is a line in, going through the coil, through the overload cutout switch, which is labelled here, normally closed. I've drawn it in the open position, <coughs> but at rest, when it's reset, it's normally closed. And then we go up there, through the uh, on-off switch, and then back through the safety circuit, which is the key, uh, which is the key switch which locks the drawers, which switches the lathe on and off. And also the cover switch, which prevents the lathe being operated without the end cover on, back to another phase. This sort of diagram is easy to read. And now I'll show you one that isn't easy to read. Just take that out. That's my earlier. Uh, that's just a sketch up, a rough sketch up that I used to work out how it all worked and then finally decide on what I was going to draw. Now this is, that's, that's the same thing. Can I actually use that one? Yes, I can use that one. Let me just check it's lined up. Yes, that's lined up okay. Right, this is a circuit diagram of my TIG welder. The circuit that's giving the problem is this piece here. That's the high frequency circuit. So looking at the high frequency circuit, anybody that knows anything about standard international symbols looks at this and says, oh, that's a capacitor and that's a capacitor. But it isn't. They've used a straight line and a curved line to indicate a capacitor. And they've used two straight lines like that to indicate a pair of contacts. But all these contacts are in relays or in contactors. But they haven't drawn the relays or contactors. They've just put the pair of contacts wherever it was convenient on the drawing. And they've given you a hint with this symbol which is a stranger to me, although I think it signifies a pair of contacts. So it signifies pair of contacts or contactor number two and a number next to the wire, which signifies the number on the wire. All the wires in this welder are black and they all have numbers on them in white, which are very difficult, sometimes impossible to read as they get older, but I've managed. So this wire here should be number six. Then this wire that continues here should be number three. Now I haven't found them yet, but the problem with this type of wiring diagram is it means that you have to unwrap all the cabling, take all the tie wraps off to find out what the numbers are. Whereas with the type of circuit diagram that I draw and that was produced in this country for years and years and years under the standard international rules, is that everything is colour coded and you can just use a multimeter to trace out the cables without having to unwrap all the tie wraps <coughs> excuse me to find the numbers on them another thing you get is where a wire crosses that's a wire crossing another wire but it doesn't connect to it that's a wire connecting to another wire so they just put a little dot on now, as you can imagine, over the years, these dots fade and the drawings get dirt on them. And soon it's very hard to see whether that wire is actually joined or whether it's just crossing. Now, there used to be a standard international symbol for a wire that just crossed. And that was a wire and a wire that crossed it. Now what's wrong with that? It's very clear and it doesn't matter how old the diagram gets and how grubby it gets, it's still obvious. Right, rant more or less over. Now there's a symbol on this uh, schematic from the uh, Interlast TIG welder, which I'm not quite sure of. And the symbol is this. It's like two V's interlocked. I'll just check you can see that. 
Yes, you can. Now, if anybody knows definitely what that symbol is, please let me know, because I could do with knowing. Uh, I'm still trying to sort out the fault on the uh, on the welder. I haven't had a chance to go back and strip all the wiring tie wraps off and go through it with a multimeter yet. <clears throat> but when I first looked, I thought, oh, well, here's the high frequency transformer, the high voltage transformer. That's the primary side, that's the secondary side, that's the output. That's the very expensive capacitor that I've already replaced. That's the spark gap. This is the air cord high frequency transformer that puts the high frequency from this circuit. Uh, it induces it into the welder circuit. That's the welding electrode cable there. So I looked at this and thought, well, there's a condenser there. I'll have to find that. That could be faulty, but of course it's not a condenser, not a capacitor, sorry. It's a pair of contacts, and I have to now find that pair of contacts, which is going to be a matter of tracing it out, because the schematic is inadequate for the job. I'll find it, but it'll take me some time. Things like this, FM. Well, eventually you'll work out that that stands for fan motor. But a standard international would show you four little fan blades on there, and you'd know straight away what it was. I eventually worked this one out as the gas valve. Right, that's the coil <coughs> in the gas valve, which they've shown not as a coil, but as an SI resistance symbol. Uh, that's the correct symbol. That's a chassis symbol, means a connection to the chassis. Uh, I've seen this curved line for a uh, capacitor before but it's not in common usage again we have a diode symbol that's in common usage and capacitors there that's fine we can understand that it, it just makes it so much easier to trace wiring quickly and to find faults if people produce good wiring diagrams with standardised symbols on them. And therein lies another problem. A lot of the standardisation that used to exist in the world has been allowed to slip. Uh, and it really is a slip into the abyss because without rigid standardisation, uh, hours of time are wasted trying to repair equipment uh, through just allowing standards to slip. It's not a good good idea. Life becomes more and more difficult. No amount of training or education will get over it. It's just a matter of being experienced. And when you read a diagram like this, as soon as you see it, you know you're going to have a harder time than you would with an SI. Uh, SI, Standard International Based Diagram, using Standard International Units. Right, chaps, well, I'm going to leave it there for this week. Uh, again, I'm still in lockdown. We're still all healthy. I shall try and get out again next week and uh, and do some more. What I'll try and do is get to the workshop and spend a day checking out the welder circuit with the multimeter. So I'll make a video of that. That could be quite interesting. But for now, enjoy, like, subscribe, please. I've noticed that 83% of the people who watch my videos are not subscribed. It doesn't cost anything to subscribe and it helps. It really does help. So if you if you like what you see and if you want to see more, subscribe, ring the little bell and then you'll get notifications when I release a new one. I try to release one every week uh, on either Friday or Saturday. I've been sticking to Fridays for a long time, but, but this is going out on Saturday night. So there you go, chaps. Thanks for watching and uh, I'll catch you next week.